Oh. Perfect. All good. So welcome everybody again. Uh, today's last speaker is Oscar Garcia Prada, and he is going to talk about color young meal equations and gravi gravitating vortices. So anytime. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and thank you uh, to the organizers and to you, Eroche, for uh, inviting me to give this talk and uh, giving me, actually, as I, I was telling Eroche some months ago, an excuse to go to one of my favorite rest restaurants after just a bit after the talk, which is a Mexican that is around the corner, to eat precisely some some tacos, if, if in case I deserve at some point uh, uh, to do that, depending on how my talk goes. Anyway, so let me uh, present you the kaler yang mills uh, equations. So this uh, we consider uh, a compact complex manifold of dimension, complex dimension N, and also a holomorphic vector bundle over M. And so the uh, somehow the question that you can ask yourself if you give, uh, if you have this uh, M, uh, this compact complex manifold and a holomorphic vector bundle, is if there is in some sense a canonical metrics on M and a Kähler metric on M and a Hermitian metric on E that are canonical in some sense. And this is exactly the proposal of the kähler yang mills equations uh, what, uh, is, a, uh, is a proposal. Uh, it's a, so it's an option for that. Um, for that I, and, uh, and so here are the equations. So these are equations, as I said, for a, a Kähler metric, a G on M and a Hermitian metric H on the vector bundle. And the first equation is, of course, very familiar Hermitian Young Mills or Hermitian Einstein equation that we have been considering um, during the, this workshop. And uh, sorry, um, oh, it's, sorry, I'm just having problems again with this. Yes. And uh, so the second equation, so here, uh, SG is the scalar curvature of the Kähler metric that we are looking for. And uh, yes, lambda G is the contraction with the Kähler form uh, corresponding to the to, to G. And alpha that appears here is a coupling constant and lambda and C are uh, real parameters determined by the topology. So the second equation couples the scalar curvature of the metric to this uh, term that involves the curvature the square of the curvature on the vector bundle. So these are these are the kähler yang mills equations, and so uh, it's very it's easy to 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 realize that lambda, as I said, are determined by the topology. You know, this is just the usual thing that we have seen several times in this uh, conference, in this workshop, and so how lambda is related to the slope of the of the vector bundle. And uh, if you integrate the second equation, you also get some, uh, you know, some expression for C related to the topological invariance of the manifold and the, the vector bundle. So these equations were introduced in a, in a paper, a joint paper with Luis Alvarez Consul and Mario Garcia Fernandez um, that uh, resulted from the thesis, the PhD thesis of uh, Mario. Um, that uh, both Luis and I supervised, uh, you know, as you can see here, uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, so uh, the uh, one um, guidance to why we consider these equations are, you know, as coming from a canonical setup, so very natural equations, comes from the moment map interpretation uh, that uh, one has. Let me explain this. Uh, for this, okay, I will take an alternative point of view uh, that has been already done here for in the case of vector bundles, but now M will be a smooth compact manifold uh, of real dimension to N. It, there is no complex structure on it yet. And then E will be also a C-infinity complex vector bundle, right? Sorry, uh, I'm abusing the notation and I, I was thinking of putting the curly E as uh, other uh, speakers have done the holomorphic but just couldn't put myself together to do it so so at the moment e is a smooth complex vector bundle over m and so then uh we consider um we fix a symplectic form omega on m and a hermitian metric h on e and by doing that we can consider um the following infinite dimensional uh, manifolds uh, the uh, uh, j here which are complex structures on the manifold m 
and then uh, as unitary connections on the Hermitian vector bundle EH. Right? So inside the product of these two manifolds, and um, we have uh, pairs uh, G and A, so a complex structure on M and a connection, unitary connection, such that I require that the uh, complex structure on M defines endows with together with omega endows M of a Kähler structure, so it's a Kähler metric, and then. Uh, also, the other condition is that A, uh, the, the zero one part of the covariant derivative of this defines a Dolbo operator uh, uh, that is integrable, that is holomorphic structure in E over the corresponding complex manifold. Yeah? So both uh, J and A have canonical symplectic structures that I won't detail here. And uh, the thing is that by uh, we can consider on uh, actually on the product, but in particular uh, restricting to P, a symplectic form that is um, just the uh, sum, uh, you know, of the of the symplectic structure on J, and then we put here some some uh, precisely some uh, weight here alpha omega A. Right, so this is alpha is this this coupling constant that appears uh, in the equations that we will see. And so there is that is our symplectic manifold. And then what is the group? And uh, so uh, so let me remind you, uh, it has been alluded uh, several times also, the Atiyah bot donaldson picture, uh, for which we consider the group of automorphisms of the uh, Hermitian vector bundle EH. So these are uh, automorphisms covering the identity, uh, inducing the identity in, in the manifold M. And uh, so G acts symplectically on the space of connections with the symplectic structure that I haven't detailed, but, uh, and there is a moment map for this and being a zero of the moment map is precisely satisfying the Hermitian uh, Young-Mills equation. And uh, so this is the Atiyah bot donaldson picture. Then we have the, um, uh, for the space of uh, complex structures on M, uh, endowed with the symplectic structure uh, omega, we have the group of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms, H, right? And so uh, Fujiki and uh, Donaldson independently uh, found that H acts symplectically on this uh, symplectic manifold and the moment map, uh, being a zero of the moment map is exactly that the scalar curvature is constant. I put the name of Quillen here that may be um, strange for uh, the people that know this uh, this subject, because uh, as I I knew I learned from Atiya, uh, long time back Atiya uh, asked Quilland about precisely whether the scalar curvature could be interpreted as a moment map in the case of uh, of surfaces, right? And so uh, Quilland gave an answer. It's not published, but you know that's why um, I put his name here. Okay, so in our situation, we considered what we call the Hamiltonian extended gauge group. And this is um, the group of uh, uh, automorphisms of the Hermitian vector bundle, but uh, covering uh, not just now the identity, but actually any Hamiltonian symplectomorphism, right? Meaning uh, exactly that you have this commutative diagram here. And so this group here, this extended Hamiltonian gauge group uh, is, um, is, a, is an extension of the usual unitary group by the group of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms. I mean, typically in gauge theory, one considers just the action of the, you know, the usual unitary gauge group, but in many problems in physics, as well as in geometry, uh, this is an example, uh, extended gauge groups play an important role. And so the, uh, the fact is that uh, J tilde, this extension, extended, uh, extended group, acts on our uh, manifolds. It acts on uh, the space of complex structures on M just by projecting to to H. That's uh, that's easy. And actually, the the extended gauge group, um, any extended gauge group, acts on the space of connections. And so, in particular, this one. And so, the key point is that indeed the um, uh, the action of uh, G tilde 
this extended gauge group on our uh, uh, space of pairs uh, endowed with the with the symplectic structure that we defined uh, before omega alpha has a moment map and being a zero of the moment map is exactly uh, being a solution of the keller yang mills equations so the keller yang mills equations do appear as moment map equations uh, from a very natural action here and so in particular if alpha is bigger than zero then you uh, the usual uh, you know Kähler um, usual uh, reduction so you have a you you have a, a canonical uh, G tilde invariant Kähler structure on on uh, the moduli space and uh, and so it's meaningful to consider the moduli space M alpha of solutions to the Kähler Yang equations um, uh, uh, and is an interesting space to to study. Um, is there any question at this point? Um, I have a very naive one. <laughs> yes, please. In case uh, E is the tangent or cotangent or some tensor boundary, do what? What are those objects that you that you get? All right. So uh, yeah, I, I, yes, is a very natural question, and you can you can try to uh, approach it right. And indeed, is a more difficult. Uh, you you have similar kind of equations, but they are even uh, more complicated, right? Uh, we haven't analyzed that uh, uh, exactly, but it's a very natural question to consider, indeed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so, let me make some remarks. The first one is that uh, uh, we recover the Hermitian Young Mills equations uh, on the one hand while the equation, the constant scalar curvature in the Yao Tian Donaldson theory is somehow preformed, right? By this coupling with the square of the, of the curvature of the uh, connection. Um, another comment is that the coupling term in the second equation, um, you know, the, the, the term that couples to the scalar curvature uh, comes precisely from the fact that this extended, uh, the, the Hamiltonian extended gauge group is a non-trivial extension. And this comes precisely from the non-triviality of the extension as a group, as, a, as an extension of groups. Also, uh, you, you know, you always would like to analyze the simplest situation and you say, oh, well, what about uh, complex dimension one? And so in complex dimension one, that is in the case of Riemann surfaces, so we have that actually the system decouples because the square of the curvature of the connection is zero. And so in this situation, we don't get anything new. We just get just a combination of the, uh, you know, the uniformization theorem on the one hand for the metric on the Riemann surface and then the narasimha seshagri theorem. So there are solutions, but they are just decoupled and uh, and we know the theory there. Uh, so the, 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 the story is more interesting, is interesting in high dimensions. Another comment I want to make is that explains also the naturality of these equations is that in a similar way as the Hermitian Young Mills equations come as a minima of a Young Mills functional and the constant scalar curvature condition is also minima of, of one of the Calabi functionals, there is a natural Calabi Young Mills functional in this situation and these are absolute minima. The solutions to the to the Kähler Young Mills are absolute minima of this Calabi Young Mills equation, Young Mills functional. Okay, so the program that we started, uh, that we um, uh, gave ourselves with the beginning of uh, Mario's thesis, and you know when it was over, was to study existence of solutions to find a nice existence theorem. And uh, well, it didn't take us very long to realize that this is a very hard problem. And uh, in general, this is a system of coupled fourth order fully nonlinear partial differential equations. And uh, those of you that have been exposed to the Yao Tian Donaldson uh, theory and so on for the constant scalar curvature or Kähler Einstein, you know, that is a very difficult problem that uh, is still not entirely resolved. And so you would just expect that this is a bit more complicated. And um, let me just say that uh, we had um, also as a motivation to study this problem, to have an analytic approach to a very natural algebraic geometric problem of Stein, uh, studying the moduli space classifying pairs of a projective variety and an algebraic holomorphic vector bundle, right? And in the same way as uh, Kähler-Einstein and constant scalar curvature have been 
you know, the study of those equations have provided algebraic geometers with a, a very beautiful gift of K theory, uh, uh, of K, uh, K stability, excuse me. Um, so we would expect that there would be some kind of K stability in the situation that would be meaningful. Yeah, and so that was a, a strong motivation. And so in the paper that in the initial paper uh, with Luis and Mario, we uh, gave some existence results for a small alpha by using perturbation uh, from constant scalar curvature, uh, scalar metrics, and also from Hermitian Yang-Mills connections. That's something you can always do, and we did. And uh, more uh, concrete and interesting solutions over polarized threefolds uh, in, in particular, not admitting any constant scalar curvature Keller metric were obtained by uh, Keller and uh, Tonson Friedman. And um, and also uh, uh, Mario Garcia Fernandez and Karl Tipler uh, added new examples to this short list by simultaneously deforming the complex structure of M and E. And this is why I actually asked Carl yesterday about this in his program of deforming things, precisely about deforming the complex structure of the manifold and the complex structure on the holomorphic vector bundle. So we, we also found, uh, you know, study obstructions in the spirit of the study of um, Kehler Einstein constant scalar curvature metrics. Uh, which generalizes the Futaki invariant and the, the Mabuchi K energy and all these ingredients that appear uh, geodesic stability uh, studied by Chen, Dons, and many others. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so there are some abstractions that we can identify, but um, a general existence theorem is still missing. So there is uh, um, indeed a lot of work to, to be done in this um, uh, in order to to find some uh, such an existence theorem for these equations. And so what we have done, uh, and uh, this is some uh, something very common in uh, engaged theory and also inspired by uh, the physics of it, is the study of uh, solutions uh, with symmetries. That is the, uh, goes under the name of dimensional uh, uh, reduction. And so the particular, um, perhaps, the, one of the simplest cases you can consider is to take our complex manifold M um, uh, to be a product of a compact Riemann surface X by the Riemann sphere. And then the group of symmetries that we are considering is SU2 acting on P1 in the in the standard way and trivially on, on X. And so this, this is study, uh, this uh, studying this problem for this situation, was initiated in a in a, a paper with um, uh, Luis Albert Consul and Mario Garcia Fernandez, and this was building upon uh, some uh, old paper of mine that actually came from my thesis about studying invariant um, vortices, connections and vortices. And so let me let me explain this. This is the dimensional reduction mechanism that um, we explored and that uh, led to what we call the gravitating vortex equations. That is the other, uh, or uh, it's the uh, other term in, in, my, in the title of my talk. So the situation is this, you start with a compact Riemann surface, X, and a holomorphic line bundle, so very simple objects, and a holomorphic section of this line bundle. And so then it's very elementary to see that the pair um, L phi uh, uh, we can associate with uh, a holomorphic, a rank two holomorphic vector bundle over the product of the Riemann surface by the Riemann sphere, by P1. And this mm, rank two vector bundle appears as an extension of the pullback of the line bundle L uh, and the pullback of the tangent bundle of, uh, of P1, the, the, the line bundle with a chain class two. So I, I claim that such a pair, uh, such, uh, such pairs correspond to uh, holomorphic bundles of this type. And it's very simple because extensions as uh, the ones here are parameterized by a first cohomology group on X cross P1 of this uh, bundle here tends to the dual of this. And then we can apply the Kenneth formula, right, to, and, uh, and the, the vanishing of sections 
of um, the vanishing the vanishing of sections of this negative uh, degree line bundle. And third duality to conclude that precisely those extensions are given by sections of the line bundle L over X. And this is very elementary. And so then the SU2 action that we had on the product of X cross P1, the usual action, uh, as I said, P1 appearing as a, as a homogeneous space um, and trivially on X um, can be lifted to the vector bundle in a way that uh, actually the, the vector bundle E becomes an SU2 equivariant holomorphic vector bundle. Um, and then um, you can also, because we are we are looking for symmetric solutions to the, our equations, we want to consider SU2 invariant Kähler metrics on X cross P1, and they all have the shape up, up to some normalization of, you know, the Kähler form has uh, uh, the shape of a pullback of a Kähler form on X and some uh, multiple of the Fubinius 2D metric on CP1, right? And we choose to put this this um, sort of uh, parameter tau here. And as, as Richard sometimes, as Richard was doing in, in his talks, I uh, also like to normalize volumes to 2pi to avoid, to avoid uh, two pies appearing, some of the uh, inequalities and so on. So the first uh, computation that is not very difficult is to show that uh, if E is the SU2 equivariant uh, rank two vector bundle that we constructed out of L and the, and the holomorphic section, then uh, an invariant, SU2 invariant solution to the kähler yang mills equations on the on this vector bundle on x cross p1 is equivalent to a solution of the following equations. You see, because of the invariance, at the end of the day, you're just solving for a metric g on x on the Riemann surface and a Hermitian metric h on the line bundle, and the equations are these equations here. This just uh, this just come as just by analyzing the uh, invariant solutions. And we call uh, gravitating vortex a solution to these equations. And actually the origin of this name for those of you that are familiar with the vortex equations is the fact that this equation here, the first equation here is actually the vortex equation. And, uh, and uh, the gravitating word um, uh, should be natural considering that we are coupling this to a metric, but this is a term that somehow was inspired by some mathematical physicists, um, Nick Manton in particular. So, so here, these are the gravitating vortex equations, and we have these uh, real parameters here, uh, tau and alpha, and uh, C in uh, appearing in the second equation is indeed um, determined by the topology in a similar way as we did before. In fact, let me just, as I was saying, this is the abelian vortex equation. And uh, one uh, first obstruction for uh, having solutions of this equation, uh, in particular with phi different than zero, actually to have solutions, let's say even allowing phi equals zero, is the degree of fell should be bounded by this parameter tau appearing here. Uh, the volume uh, is, this is a point where I haven't normalized the volume of X. I was happy to just normalize the volume of P1 to 2 pi, but here I left this um, for some reason. And um, and so this is one first obstruction that one has to solve the abelian vortex equation. And it's a, a theorem that has many proofs now and uh, independent proofs uh, by uh, Noguchi and, uh, and Steve Bradlow and uh, myself, I gave two proofs actually that the existence of solutions to the vortex equation is equivalent exactly to this to this uh, degree of L being bounded by tau, the volume of X times two pi. I mean, in this problem, uh, you know, in this in, in the study of the abelian vortex equation, the Kähler metric is fixed. Huh? So the problem is really finding a uh, Hermitian metric H on L. And, um, and if you want, uh, coming back to, if you want to have solutions where phi is different than zero, then there is, you know, a strict bound here. The degree of L has to be strictly smaller, uh, as you can see from, from this equation by integrating, is, is already integrated, excuse me, just from that equation. 
Um, any questions at this point? Well, if not, let's go on. And so now let's come back to the gravitating uh, vortex equations. Uh, just these equations here. We have just been pondering about this first one, but now coming back and uh, in particular looking at the second equation and uh, um, integrating um, the first equation, we actually, by, uh, this already we have done. So we got this uh, thing, but I'm revisiting now here. But now from the uh, integrating the second equation and the relation between scalar curvature and the Euler class of X, we have this. And so then um, we realize that the, the topological uh, uh, real number that appeared in the second equation, this C, is actually, here it is explicitly given in terms of the topology of X and the topology of L and all the um, the parameters that appear in the in the in the equations. And you see by looking at this uh, expression here that uh, if in particular we want to study the case in which C is positive, meaning bigger or equal than zero, then the Riemann surface must be P1, must be the Riemann sphere, yeah? And so, uh, so then, um, okay, so you see when we wrote our equations, the Kähler-Yang-Mills, the general Kähler-Yang-Mills equations, we were very anxious to look, um, to look uh, in the literature to see if physicists had been um, considering them in particular because they appear so naturally, right? But we were a bit disappointed that they, uh, well, we were not able to find uh, these equations in the physics literature. However, uh, we saw that our um, gravitating vortex equations when C equals zero, which in particular implies, as, as I said, that the, the, the Riemann surface X itself is actually P1, then in that situation, um, these equations have been studied, and they are known also as the einstein bogomolny equations, and the solutions are called Nielsen-Olsen cosmic strings. There is a, a very big literature on these equations, and in this context, the parameter alpha that we had there has some meaning in terms of, you know, some universal gravitation constant. And already the abelian vortex equations, yes, initially, um, are uh, related to the, the the theory of superconductivity, um, except that in the, the theory of superconductivity, this is a study on the complex plane, not on a compact Riemann surface. And and by the way, let me just say that uh, the um, the uh, existence theorem for the vortex equations, the billion vortex equations on the complex plane, not on a compact surface, was. Uh, done by uh, uh, Cliff Taubes in his uh, thesis, and it's appeared in the very beautiful book by him and um, uh, Jaffa, Arthur Jaffa, uh, on vortices and monopoles. And in that book, actually, they comment about this dimensional reduction, uh, this connection of solutions to the vortex equations with instantons. And also uh, Witten, uh, also um, applies this dimensional reduction for the vortex, a billion vortex equations on the hyperbolic plane. So the idea was not very new. It was just uh, going back to my thesis where we put it that in a more algebraic geometric uh, context in the case of projective curves. So this, as I, as I said, there is a very uh, extended literature and here are some uh, early works on this by uh, Lynette Comtet, uh, Gibbons, and uh, Sprague, and uh, Jisung Yang have done a lot of the analysis of these equations, and and I will uh, allude to uh, Jisung Yang in in just a few minutes, like right now. So Jisung Yang um, considered the case of um, uh, these equations um, in the situation where uh, c is zero, and remember in this situation. Uh, we uh, the Riemann surface is just P1. And let me phrase um, uh, his theorem in a language that he, he didn't put in this, in this language, but let me just express it this way. The section phi, so we're giving, you know, a line bundle, holomorphic line bundle and, and a holomorphic section, 
and uh, this uh, line bundle has 10 class of degree n and the zeros of phi defined an effective uh, divisor right given by ni and pi are points points in the in p1 and these are integers right and uh, positive integers and so so uh, the first Mm, assumption that you have to make necessarily, you know, is the one that you have to, you, you need to solve the uh, billion vortex equations, that is that the churn class is bounded by by this uh, uh, tau times the volume of x, x is here uh, p1, I'm oh, sorry about that, but uh, x is p1. And then, uh, then the einstein bogomolny equations, that is the name that these equations have in the c equals zero situation, have solutions if these numbers here and i are bounded by um, half uh, the degree of the line bundle yeah for every i so all these numbers have to be bounded by uh, the churn class uh, over two and there is also another situation which is that a solution exists if this divisor uh, is actually um, is just have two points p1 and p2 n has to be even right and then it has to be uh, is of this form right so this uh, you also have solutions in that uh, in that uh, situation okay so so uh, a way of you know approaching these equations and this is what uh, young did is that um, you fix a metric on x and you fix uh, G0 and a metric H0 on L. And then you are solving for uh, G now, any other metric on X can be just expressed in terms of G0 by exponential of some real function, uh, U, e to, to U. The same for the Hermitian metric on L. And so then the gravitating vortex equations um, are equivalent. In fact, the, the full gravitating vortex equations, meaning when you have actually uh, C. This is true, in fact, for any, uh, not just for P1, and you are not assuming here C uh, being uh, these uh, 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 topological number, these number determined topology, you're not, we're not assuming to be zero. Okay. But now, if it is zero, then uh, from this equation, right, uh, you obtain. Um, that uh, uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, this equality here, u is a constant uh, plus this, and then you can plug u in the first equation. And so you end up with a much simpler equation to which you can apply a continuity method and is a sort of, you know, uh, some kind of kasdan warner type equation, a bit more complicated. And so, um, uh, so Young finds that in order to prove existence of solutions, one needs to assume this condition on the numbers in defective divisor being bounded by the churn class divided by two, or as I said, this uh, situation in which the divisor is, uh, is concentrated at two points and the multiplicity is n over two, so n, n must be even, right? So, um, and then he says in his paper, uh, says that this condition here is a technical restriction on the local string number. String number is n. I mean, sometimes called the vortex number, but it's just a chain class. And it is not clear at this moment whether it may be dropped. This is the comment he made. Uh, I guess he was perhaps expecting that that was a, a technical condition that you could drop. Now, the fact is that um, this condition is indeed necessary condition. And this condition actually comes from the geometry of the problem. It's not a technical condition. And it comes from the algebraic geometry of the problem. I'll, I'll, I'll explain, I'll try to explain this. So this is, um, the study of this is done in two, in two papers. So uh, this uh, first paper uh, in which um, uh, Luis, uh, Mario, and I had another collaborator, Vamsi Pingali, and uh, and then um, uh, this appeared already in Math and Island in 2021, and then an, a second paper that uh, in which we added another uh, author, and 
uh, Chenjiang Yao, and this um, will should be appearing at the beginning of next week uh, in the uh, archive. And so, so it turns out that Young's technical restriction has, as I was anticipating, an, an algebra geometric meaning. And this is a meaning for the natural action of SL2C uh, on the moduli space of vortices. Um, the moduli space of vortices on a, on a, on a Riemann surface um, X is as a symmetric product of the Riemann surface X, in this case, P1. And in this particular situation, the nth symmetric product of P1 is actually isomorphic to Pn. In fact, this Pn appears precisely as the projectivization of the uh, n plus one dimensional space of holomorphic sections of this line bundle, the, the, the unique holomorphic line bundle of chain class n on P1. And uh, and so then uh, the thing is that it turns out that actually, uh, so SL2C acts on this space because SL2C, uh, I was um, alluding before to the action of SU2 uh, as on P1, but this is, you know, SL2C acts on P1. In fact, P1 is a quotient of SL2C by a maximal parabolic subgroup of SL2C. And so, so you have the action of SL2C on P1, and therefore, you have an action of S to C on the symmetric product of P1. And now we can consider the Mumford uh, geometric uh, stability ge geometric invariant theory uh, um, tells us that in, indeed in this situation, this condition that Ni is strictly smaller than N over 2 is precisely saying that this point of the symmetric product is GAT stable. And that this other solution here that happened could happen, the situation when n is even, corresponds to this divisor, this effective divisor being um, uh, uh, in relation to the action of SL2C, uh, is strictly polystable. Huh? So this is the, the, the study, by the way, of this um, sort of um, action of SL2C and on the symmetric product of P1 is a very classical subject. And uh, it goes back at least to Sylvester in the study of, um, uh, you know, in, in the study of binary quintics uh, going back to the end of the 19th century. So it's definitely a very classical subject and appears in this very natural algebraic geometric problem as a GIT a stability condition here. And so what then uh, a main theorem uh, that we prove is indeed that um, if there exists a solution to the gravitating vortex equations, and here we we assuming um, you know that uh, we are not assuming that c is equal to zero; it could be just bigger or equal than zero on p one L phi because necessarily the Riemann surface is p one. Then the divisor d defined by uh, the the L and phi is GAT polystable. In particular, in the case of c equals zero, this provides a converse of Young's theorem. Okay. Now, let me tell you a little bit of, of um, the genesis of this theorem. The fact is that in this paper that appear in Math and Allen, we claim that theorem, and uh, but then um, our younger collaborator Chen Yang Yao said. I'm not very convinced about uh, one step in the proof. And so uh, we looked carefully and we realized that there was a gap in the proof. And that last step, uh, you know, the whole paper is developing this uh, uh, towards this theorem, but that last step was like two pages in, a, in, a, in this paper that, you know, and uh, it turns out that uh, the proof uh, uh, that we uh, so we have been able to 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 uh, to fill in this gap, and the two page thing has exploded into a fifty page paper, and uh, and this is what um, actually we uh, we do in this in this paper that I am saying will appear shortly in the archive, and uh, so let me say that actually. Uh, in fact, the uh, notice that we are proving 
this theorem also when c is bigger than zero, right? And uh, but Young's theorem is for c equals zero. So uh, Garcia, Fernandez, Pingali, and Yao proved actually the analog of the Young's theorem, uh, Young's theorem for the case in which c was uh, positive, right? And this appeared in twenty twenty one. Um, so, um, in this approach that we uh, took in this new paper, we were able to achieve actually more. And uh, one thing that uh, we uh, had not been able to do in the previous paper was about uniqueness of solutions. So, um, in this other paper, um, we proved that uh, in the genus uh, bigger uh, or equal than one, uh, or in if genus of x is zero, but uh, phi vanishes at least in three points, then um, the uh, smooth solutions to the gravitating vortex equations with fixed volume that has necessarily to 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 uh, to um, to have this bound to satisfy this bound, otherwise no solutions to the abelian vortex equations. Then the solutions are unique, and. Also, I mean, I'm alluding here to some solutions in the in the case of uh, Riemann surfaces that uh, are not uh, so no, not of genus zero, but now for any uh, genus bigger or equal than one, we we're also able to prove an existence theorem under uh, some uh, conditions. Uh, necessarily, the first condition always has to be satisfied is the this bound in order to have solutions of the abelian vortex equation. And then there are other, more or less, uh, <laughs> yes, I am I was going to say technical conditions, but I don't want, yeah, maybe, you know, at some point I would say, comes as said, no, they are not technical. But uh, yeah, we really did, you know, this, because we apply the continuity method and somehow we need some bounds. And so, um, so we, we prove existence of solutions uh, for um, genus bigger than zero, and uh, uh, at least in some regime, for the parameters, right? And uh, in the in the paper uh, in this paper in Math and Allen, we had already given a um, a theorem, an existence theorem for surfaces uh, of genus bigger than zero. But this uh, this theorem, in a sense, they are a little bit disjoint. I mean, so we have like two theorems, but this is a, in some sense an improvement. And in particular, what is definitely an improvement is precisely thanks to the uniqueness that I was referring this other theorem is that uh, then the, this solution is unique. Yeah? So this is the one thing. And so let me just um, say something about um, the approach that we took um, so first of all, yeah, let me just, um, perhaps you can, if you compare with the problem of uh, Kähler-Einstein or, you know, um, the constant scalar curvature, you realize that the, the P1 situation is like the Fano situation, right? Where there's some stability condition that has to be satisfied. And uh, this, this is stability condition here. And, uh, for genus bigger than one, bigger than than zero, there are there's really no no G8, no no stability condition. So it's very similar to somehow what happens right in Kähler Einstein metrics. And uh, I mean this is in a sense a, a problem very much related to to that uh, to that um, uh, to that technology that situation. And um, so. Um, so let me tell you uh, some of the key um, ingredients in the new approach that we took that uh, was, um, uh, you know, that allowed us allowed us to uh, to 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 solve the gap in the in, in our proof. And I mean, uh, as very often happens when you find a mistake or a gap or something, in very very favorable situations, you learn quite a lot and. You find that there is indeed a new a, a new world there, and in a sense, this is what happened here. And so, the uh, first thing is that um, we took uh, an approach that is um, goes in the name of symplectic reduction by stages. And so, the the thing is, 
that as the kähler yang mills equations, uh, the gravitating vortex equations appear as moment map equations. I mean, you can see that from the dimensional reduction uh, procedure, but it's something that you can see directly. And the point there is that, as in the kähler yang mills the gauge group, the natural uh, group of symmetries is this extension, this Hamiltonian extended gauge group, where now G is the uh, gauge group of the unitary line bundle, the Hermitian line bundle LH, and H is just the, uh, you know, the group of Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms of vo or volume preserved in this case, sort of um, uh, on, the, on the surface, right? And so then the thing is that uh, the symplectic reduction by stages, whenever you have this kind of situation, is that you can, you can perform symplectic reduction first by G, and then consider a residual, the residual Hamiltonian action by H. And this is exactly what we did. And uh, this kind of by, uh, puts you in a setup um, where we now can uh, consider um, a reduced K energy. These are ingredients that appear very much in the theory of Kähler Einstein and constant scalar curvature. And this uh, reduce uh, K, well, actually we call it K alpha because it is this parameter alpha, K alpha energy is a functional defined on the infinite dimensional space of Kähler potentials. So in solving the problem, so you first, by doing symplectic reduction by G first, you are sort of solving by, uh, you fix like a, a Kähler metric and you solve the abelian vortex equations that we know that we can solve. And uh, then, uh, but of course, uh, now uh, the um, the whole thing depends on the, on the Kähler metric that you put. And this is where this residual action comes. And so in to study this problem, you fix a, a, a Kähler form and you can express the others in terms of uh, the space of Kähler potentials. And so there, you know, there are many technical difficulties, but in uh, one of them is that we need to extend this to a, a certain Finsler completion that has been recently studied by Darvash, uh, Tamash Darvash and others and uh, a lot of bounds to prove the convexity of the extended K energy. So this has been, you know, I'm sim <laughs> it's a 50 page paper with many, um, you know, a lot of analysis and we are, I'm oversimplifying, but uh, of course we don't have uh, much time here. But let me just, um, before finishing that, I would like to uh, comment that as far as we know, this, uh, you know, moment map equations uh, appear, of course, in gauge theory and in, in study of canonical metrics in uh, Kähler geometry and so on. But we are not aware of the this procedure of uh, uh, symplectic reduction by stages whenever you have an extension. So this is a first, uh, we believe, instance of, of that. And the thing is that this opens somehow a door uh, of possibilities for perhaps um, uh, approaching the general problem. And um, this problem I have presented here is just like the simplest possible situation. And in particular, the notion of case stability that we are after or similar to case stability turns out to be just GIT stability in a very sort of uh, very natural uh, algebraic geometric and old geometric algebraic geometric problem. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your talk. Let's all thank.